Uh, th uh, thanks, thanks for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and for those who are the same as me on the uh, West Coast, good morning. So today I will introduce you to you our uh, recent research on materials graph networks and also to uh, perform a tutorial on how to use the package that we developed for constructing graph networks to uh, predict materials properties. And to begin with, Constructing the structure property relationship has always been the central goal in material science. About well, 100 years ago, uh, Paul Dirac has famously said that the underlying physics law necessary for the mat mathematical theory of a large part of physics and the whole chemistry are thus completely known with the discovery of quantum mechanics. However, as he also noticed noted that uh, the difficulty is that the exact application of these laws leads to the equations are much too complicated to be solvable. And uh, unfortunately, this is even true after about 100 years. 100 years. And nowadays, even with the uh, approximation using the density functional theory, the ab initio calculations are still too slow to run on a large scale. For example, when we evaluate the thermodynamic stability of a new material, those calculations can take us about hours on a supercomputer. And for more advanced properties, like the uh, dynamic stability using the phonon calculations, those can take probably days. And also, what we usually do in our lab is to calculate the diffusivity of a material. And for those calculations, we typically need to uh, calculates a, a variety of uh, temperatures, and those can easily take weeks on a supercomputer. So uh, fortunately, with the recent development of data science and machine learning, we are shifting our research from computational driven science to uh, data enabled science. In material science, this is uh, shown by, by the uh, paradigm as I show on the right. Well, Existing computations and experiments have already produced a substantial amount of data, and with those data, we can construct a surrogate models using data science or machine learning. And next time when we have a new structure or new uh, molecule structure, we can use our surrogate machine learning models to predict the properties directly within a sub sub-second uh, speed on our laptop instead of going to the supercomputer. So the machine learning is the study of computer algorithms that improve automatically through experience. Here, the, the, the experience is just the, the materials data that we already have at hand. And the, the eventual goal would be using machine learning uh, with the materials data to construct such a model that can replace or uh, accelerate the experiments or ab initial calculations. There, uh, the machine learning, some, some people who are not uh, familiar with machine learning may be, uh, may be scared by this, this word and they, they may think that machine learning is something that, is, that only exists in computer science. Uh, in reality, as a material scientist, we can just treat the machine learning as a glorified code fading and a pattern recognition. Essentially, we're trying to uh, model this behavior that map the input to the output, right? So here the input is usually our structure of material or the molecule structure, and the output would be the property that we're interested in. For example, the formation energy, the band gap, etc. And nowadays machine learning has been used uh, in many different fields and has re revolutionized the, the way that we uh, interact with the, uh, the outside world. For example, now we can, on Netflix, the algorithm will automatically re recommend the different um, episodes to us. And also we, have, we are seeing the uh, self-driving cars and those uh, fancy models that can beat human, the best human performers on the, uh, the game of Go. In material science, there are, two, there are generally two directions of we, how we do the materials machine learning. The first direction is to, to construct so-called uh, compositional models. So in those models, instead of uh, describing the materials as a complex object. Here we are only using the compositional level information. For example, given a, given a structure, we just take the formula and then we calculate the uh, aggregated statistics on the properties of elements. For example, uh, we, for the ion oxide, ammonia oxides, we just take the average atomic mass 
for this formula, or we can also take take the average column and the periodic tape on the periodic table for the elements in the composition. So uh, surprisingly, such models have shown very good performance when they predict some basic properties. And the, but one of the issue is that the composition models cannot distinguish the polymers. For example, given a graphite and a diamond, we know that both of them have the same uh, same uh, carbon composition, but in reality, their properties are vastly different. And one is a very soft soft material, and the other is a super hard with a wide band gap. And uh, here, if we just use the compositional models, we are not we, we for sure we cannot really uh, predict the the, dis, the distinct properties for graphite and diamond. And the other line of thought is to use the so-called structural models. So for those of you who have attended the talk uh, from last week from Yun Xin in, in, in our group, and he introduced the machine learning interactomic potentials. So in such kind of uh, structural models, one just uh, calculated the fingerprints that describe the local environment of the atom and eventually to describe the overall structure. And then using those fingerprints, we combine them with uh, our machine learning models. In such, in such way, we will be able to construct a very accurate model to describe the potential energy surface. And um, unfortunately, uh, as you may also notice in the last talk, such applications is usually limited to uh, a small number of elements. So you have to train one model at a time for our individual chemical uh, chem individual chemical space. For example, you have a one model for for a uh, molybdenum and one model for nickel moly system and one model for a uh, lithium nit nitride system. So those are like case by case. That there is no such thing called a universal machine learning model that you can use to predict all of this. All, all the elements and all the crystal structures in the uh, in the SSD or known known material space. Today, today, what we are going to talk about is the so-called uh, graph networks. It's a structural structure based uh, machine learning algorithm. So uh, the the core idea is to is given a structure, we try to represent such a structure using our graph. Where in this case. The atoms will be the nodes of the graph, and the bounds will be the edges of the graph. So during the computation or in the graph networks, we are we will propagate information from the the nodes or the atom to the neighboring bounds, and also eventually to the neighboring atoms. So such such operation is performed locally, and that's what that's why sometimes people call this as a, a graph convolutional neural network. So it's basically a convolution operation that is applied to the local structure of the graph. And after a few, after a few iterations of convolution, uh, we'll eventually arrive at the output graph. So this output graph is more uh, encode more abstract information of the input of the input structure. And afterwards, we compress the output graph to a feature vector. Uh, that represent the structure that represent our structure or molecule. And once we have the feature vector of the structure, it's very easy to uh, map this vector into the target variables using uh, a feedforward neural networks or any other means. And as you can see, that all this, this description is relatively general. And I do not specify whether this apply only to the structure or a molecule. Or I also did not specify that this only apply to a certain elements. So the reason is that such approach and such a representation can be relatively uh, trans can be actually very transferable in the sense that I can apply this to all the structure uh, and all the molecules. And as, as I will show later that such approach is also very accurate and can be um, uh, can be applied to all sorts of data sets. So uh, the graph is at the core of this uh, approach. Here in our approach, we have a slightly different uh, definition of the graph. Uh, in addition to the nodes and the, the edges uh, represented using the atoms and the bounds, we also included something called the global state. So the global state is uh, in the global state. We put the information that is not a, that is independent of the structure. That can be external conditions. 
for example, the temperature, the pressure, etc. And for describing the bounds, we use a, a Gaussian expanded distance. And for the atom, we just use the, the atomic number as the uh, if, as the uh, bound as the atom representation. So during during the graph convolution, we first update the bound information by including the neighboring atoms as well as the global state and the previous bound state, and then we update the atom state and eventually the the uh, the global state update. And here the phi's are are approximated using the uh, neural or artificial neural networks because those functions are universal universal approximators we can use to approximate almost any continuous functions. Uh, so that, that explains one of the graph operation. And uh, in reality, we have to st stack many layers of this graph convolution together. And uh, so here are the, the building blocks of the materials graph networks, or magnet for short. And, uh, and the implementation has already been open source on our group, uh, group GitHub web page. Okay, once we have the model, the first data set that we use is the so-called QM9 molecule data sets. So such a data set contains more than 130,000 molecules and more than 13 different properties calculated on, on each of the, the molecule. And we perform a train validation a test split using the 80%, 10%, and 10% split. And uh, so I want to emphasize a several metric here is the the uh, internal energy, the free energy, as well as the uh, HOMO and the LUMO values, and the, uh, the, the cap summer capacity. So here, the magnet model that we construct in this work uh, has achieved a relatively high accuracy compared to the previous works. And uh, for those properties, it even exceeds the chemical accuracy. The so chemical accuracy are, those, are the are the error between the calculation and the experimental values. So those are the, the best value that you can achieve using any kind of ab initio calculations. And overall, for the 13 properties, we have achieved the state-of-the-art performance on 11 of them. And maybe this value have changed during the past years. And uh, this, since those are already the metrics that are from two years ago. And uh, if we just as mentioned earlier, if I, if I just use the Z, the atomic number as an atomic feature, still the, the magnet model are, are actually quite uh, accurate. And then uh, instead of, in addition to the molecule data sets, we also move on to the, uh, the materials project crystal database. So for that database, it's, uh, it contains almost all the crystal structures that we know and uh, also with the density functional theory calculated properties. So we apply our magnet model to the formation energy, band gap, elasticity, as well as uh, some uh, classification task. And we find that the magnet model can achieve consistently high accuracy in all those properties, in all those properties. Mm. And, and then afterwards, since we have the infrastructure, we are trying to use the infrastructure to solve a more challenging problem in material science. And one of the problem is that uh, in material science, we usually encounter, encounter uh, the situation where the very high accurate data set is usually very small, while the very uh, inaccurate data are actually pretty large. So this is uh, best explained in this case for the band gap well, we can see that the very cheap and, uh, and the large data sets is the, uh, the PBE from the PBE function calculations. And this data set is huge. And however, for more accurate functionals, for example, the HSC, the GLLB, SC, the scan, and, and, and especially the experiments, the data set is considerably smaller. And, very naturally, it brings us to think, uh, can we use the high, uh, the, the large but uh, less accurate data to improve the model prediction on the small but accurate uh, data or the high fidelity data? So if you remember previously in the graph networks, we have construct, we have encoded the uh, structural independent information to the global state. 
And here, the fidelity information itself is not really re relevant to the structure. And hence, we can encode the fidelity information as a categorical variable into the global states of the graph networks. By using such a simple approach, we are able to uh, incorporate the, the properties calculated from different sources or, the, or even uh, from experimental measurement into one single model that we can predict the very accurate uh, property of the material. So here I'm showing you the, the model uh, performance on including different number of uh, data fidelity into the same, into the one single model. For the one fidelity model, which means we train one model individually for each of the fidelity. So here, those are the, the errors. Uh, if we use, if we incorporate uh, like a low fidelity data into the model, so here the low fidelity is the PBE fidelity. We can see the model errors on the high fidelity task. For example, the GLBSC, the HSC, and the experiments are reduced substantially. And we also, uh, going forward, we also include the full fidelity into the same single model. We see that the model error on the high fidelity task uh, also uh, further decreases. For, so that's, so that's uh, all for the model metrics. So next, uh, I'm gonna lead, uh, lead you to the, the uh, NanoHub resource. So if you can open the NanoHub with me. Oh, so before I go to the tutorial session, any questions from the audience? No? No questions? Okay, so let's go to the uh, go to the tutorial session. So uh, if you open the magnet tools, this is this is where you will uh, be looking at. Here I'm going to show first. I will still do some introduction of the mechanism of how do how do we uh, construct the graph networks. Then I will go to uh, introduce to you how can we use the pre-trained models that we can directly use out of the box to predict the properties that we are interested in. And then uh, I will go, uh, anyone? Then I will go to show some examples of how do we train a molecule model and also our crystal formation energy model using crystal data sets. And lastly, I will, uh, I will give a tutorial how, how do we train a multi-fidelity Oh. Oh. Okay. Let Let me Let me. Uh, I will end the last show and then switch to, to the. Let me see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Can, can you see the, the screen now? I, I suppose so, right? The Google Chrome? Okay. Yeah, yeah sorry about that. I my first time using the, the this function in the this software. So uh so this is the this will be our tutorial session. Well I will first give a short introduction of uh of the mechanisms of constructing graph networks. And then I will go to the, uh, using the pre-trained graph models. We actually shared all the trained models as you said earlier on the metrics side. And those models can be used out of box to do a new prediction of new molecule or new uh, crystal structure that you have. And then I will show you how, to, how do we train a new molecule and our new crystal models from our, our or materials data sets. And lastly, I will uh, do some tutorial on how do we train a multi-fidelity crystal band gap uh, model as I, sh I showed uh, earlier. 
So uh, the materials graph networks is actually a implementation of a graph networks that is uh, recently summarized by uh, the people from uh, DeepMind. So they have a, a very nice overview of uh, summarization of a summary of all the different graph approach and then put them under one umbrella of graph networks. So the graph networks, the motivation of, of that work is that um, as uh, uh, so for all the artificial intelligence, the combinatorial generalization is the top or top uh, priority. So that's that essentially says how do we use a limited number of uh, examples to uh, to learn from them, to learn the relation between them, and then apply the learned uh, rules to unlimited number of uh, instances or observations. And in the work, they argue that uh, the structure, structure, the representation, and computation are key to realizing these objectives. To understand the relational reasoning uh, behind this, they de de defined a few uh, prop, a few uh, quantities. One is called the entity. Entity is the element or object with attributes. So in our case, it's just the atoms, right? The atoms are the entities, and the relation. The relation is the property between the entities. So in our case, the relation is just the how do we form the bounds between the atoms. And eventually the rule, the rule is the function that maps the entity and the relation to other entity and the relations. So in our case, it's just the graph convolution. And uh, there's a core concept called the inductive bias. So the inductive bias is the set of assumptions that the learner use to predict the outcome of a given input that has not uh, had not has not encountered. So uh, you may not have noticed, but every time we train a new model, we actually have a uh, having uh, inductive bias. For example, uh, when when you train a linear model on the data sets, how do you know that the data sets follow a linear relation? So those are the inductive bias that we pose on the data sets. Uh, various deep learning models have their own characteristics and their own inductive bias. So for the fully connected uh, neural networks or just the artificial neural networks, there is, the inductive bias is relatively weak. So we are saying that all the input neurons can be linked to the output neurons. So there is really no uh, strong inductive bias here. For the convolutional neural networks, uh, we are saying that um, the relationship is relatively local. We are applying a convolution operation to our small a local sample of pixels, right? So the inductive bias is that the relationship is relatively local. And for the recurrent neural networks, we are saying that uh, the input follows a sequence. So there is a sequentiality in the inductive bias. And for the graph networks, we are essentially saying that the, all the nodes and the, uh, are connected, the nodes are connected using the, uh, from the edges, and the inductive bias is relatively arbitrary. And uh, it, it may be surprising, but the graph networks is, uh, you can actually project many, uh, many relationship into, onto the graph networks. In our case, we are saying that uh, a molecule structure or a crystal structure <clears throat> can be projected to a graph network. And uh, <clears throat> in general physics, the, a mass spring system can also be a graph networks. Uh, even the M body system, we are saying that uh, the interaction between the different bodies, they, they are, you can think of them as uh, connected by some edges, and then they can form a graph, and then so on and so forth. And uh, in there, we also follow the original graph definition by including the uh, global states in the re graph representation, and the update steps are actually, are actually the same as uh, what they proposed in the original work. So that's how we had the idea of materials graph networks is essentially our implementation of the graph networks uh, from the deep mind. And that's that's for the intro and let's go to the uh, pre-trained model. Can you see this? Uh, yeah, actually this morning I noticed that maybe many people are using the, the tools at the same time and we had some issues with the running TensorFlow. So maybe you can download the, all the, the repo and then run this locally on your own computer and those will give you the same results. So uh, here, the magnet is the, is the tool that we use. 
it's called the, the materials graph networks and then you can uh, import the the model itself it's called the magnet model and uh, loading a loading or pre-trained model can be as simple as calling just one line of code it's just a from fire and we have sh we have shared all the pre-trained models on in our uh, github repository you may if you have time you can go there and then download all these models to play play with them and once we have the model we still need a structure right so here to to load the structure we use the uh, python material genomics or the packaging package for uh, loading for load the zip files from a uh, from a local disk now here i'm showing you a, a simple example of a uh, sodium chloride and here we loading the the structure from our local zip file can be also as simple as uh, just one line of code. And afterwards, we use the model to predict the structure. And uh, from that prediction, we can get the formation energy per atom. And in this case, the formation energy per atom for the sodium chloride is uh, zero point is negative two point zero nine eV per atom. And if we go to the materials project website and we check the formation energy per atom calculated using DFT, uh, those values actually match pretty well with uh, the uh, magnet predicted values. So it's, it's not surprising because the the train the model is was previously trained on the materials project data. And similarly, we can use the band gap model and. First, we load the model, the band gap regression model, and then we predict the band gap of the, the same, uh, the, this uh, crystal structure that we just loaded. And here, the band gap value for sodium chloride is predicted to be 4.886 eV, and it's also quite close to the, uh, to the value that we have on the materials project database. So we also include the elasticity model. Again, this value, the, uh, the, the prediction process is the same as previous one. And one small subtlety is that uh, here, instead of feeding the, the uh, bulk or shear modulus directly, we have chosen to fit the log 10 of those values. And uh, eventually, if you want to predict the, proper, the, the elasticity property of the structure, you have to convert the quantity back to the uh, bulk modulus and shear modulus by taking the, the 10, 10 power of, of the, them. Again, this value, the elasticity values actually match pretty well with, uh, with the reality. So, and we also, oh, sorry, this is true before, and we also have a, a in, internal energy model for the, for the molecules. For the molecules, we the APIs or the application programmable uh, interface is the same as the crystals. So essentially, we just construct a molecule and then we load the model from, from the pre-trained uh, uh, repository and then we predict the property, of, the property of this new molecule. So that's pretty much for how do we use the pre-trained model. It should be relatively simple to catch, right? Uh, are there any questions on this side? No? No questions on this? Yeah. If you are answering questions, you can take a good minute and comment them in the Q&A. OK. Uh, let me see if I can find them. Actually, OK. Uh, actually, Yes. Uh, yes, at the graph networks, it cannot really uh, exceed the density function theory in terms of accuracy because the graph networks here we are we are uh, training the model on the DFT data, right? It has to be worse than the DFT. For the silicon, I, I remember that we get a 0 0.7 or something EV from uh, the graph networks. And also that, that value is, oh, 
of course, it's smaller than the true value of 1.4 EV, about 1.4 EV, if I remember correctly. Yeah. EV, yes, yes, correct. So that error is res with respect to the DFT value. And the DFT value, uh, in this case, the PBE uh, functional has an error about one EV with respect to the experimental results. So there's uh, two different types of error source in the overall prediction. If, you pr if you're comparing the prediction value to the, ex to the experimental value. Uh, that's why we have this uh, multi-fidelity graph networks where we also include some of the experimental value. We're trying to use the, the low fidelity PBE data to improve the model performance on the high fidelity task. So let's go to the uh, training of molecule internal energy model. Well, here the first we need to uh, load the data. Here the data has already been uh, saved on the, uh, in the repo. Basically, it's just the key value pairs or the dictionary. The key is the, is the QM9 ID for the, for the uh, molecule. And, uh, and for each of the QM9 ID, we have the molecule object dictionary, and we also have the properties and also the smiles representation. It's a, actually a string value for representing the molecule. But, but we don't need, really need those uh, for now in this model. And uh, the, basically, the way that we construct a graph network model is first we, first, first we read the data. The data consists of uh, uh, structural objects and as well as the target properties. And as you can see, the molecules are read using just a simple line of code, which we loop through all the QM9 IDs and we get the molecule objects. It's a list of molecule objects. And then we also have a list of uh, target properties. In this case, we just take the U0 value out of the, uh, out of the uh, uh, property list. And, uh, and we should, the overall number of molecule here is 100. So I deliberately choose a small number so that you can run on the, uh, notebook, but unfortunately it cannot run today. Maybe you just downloaded them, download them and run it on a local computer. And then uh, normally we would split the data into train and test using some kind of random uh, split or some other uh, method that you prefer. And here I'm splitting the train and uh, test using a 80% and 20% ratio. And the way that we construct the uh, the magnet model is by a few steps. So first, first, as you can, as you, uh, you probably remember that in the representation, we are trying to compress the structure into a, 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 a vector. And in that case, in that case, if we double the size of the structure, then uh, we have to make sure that the structure vector does not change, which means which means we are essentially predicting an intensive property. For the extensive property, we have to multiply the output by the number of atoms. So that's the, that's the major difference between this uh, model and other models. And we have to tell the model that, okay, the, the U0 is an ext extensive pro quantity, which means we have to multiply this, the output by the number of atoms eventually. And then we have the scalar of the of the uh, for the targets and we construct a graph converter the graph converter is how do we uh, c calculate a graph from the uh, molecule or the uh, the crystal structure and i, I know uh, here i use the cross crystal graph it's only because uh, because as, as i mentioned earlier this model is quite transferable and the cross crystal graph here means that i can just take the atomic number from the the atom or the elements as the uh, inputs. So such approach can be applied to molecule as well. That's why I'm here I'm just using the crystal graph. And the last step is how do we uh, construct our model? It's actually one simple line of code. We specify the graph converter and we also specify the centers for the Gaussian basis for the expansion of the distance. And we also specify the Gaussian basis width and we tell them we tell it's the target scalar. So that's how we construct our simple uh, magnet model. 
And surprisingly, even with the simple construction, we can train the model relatively effectively. So it's a, we can just call the model dot train and the train molecule and the train targets. And we specify the number of epochs and the verbers controls how much information that we want to output when we train the model on the fly. And once we have trained the model, we just predict the, the uh, molecule property from the test data sets. And we plot the predicted, uh, predicted value for the test data sets and also the, the true test targets. And as, as you can see, that using such a very simple uh, construction, this molecule model can capture the trend relatively well. So that's, that's uh, all for the molecule model construction. Any questions? No? So the, uh, then I will. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. If, in fact, if you read the CGCN paper, you will notice that they have a, a extra data filtering step. So the data filtering step, they eliminated all those, the crystal structures that do not have the band structure calculated. But uh, in, in the magnet model, actually, I actually did not apply those uh, filters. I just uh, you use all the data that we have and uh, Presumably, those without the band structure calculation will give you a slightly different different results. Yeah, because the uh, sorry, I have I have to mention that there are two ways to calculate the band gap. One is from uh, the band structure calculation. The other is from the density of state calculation. And for uh, the CGCN, they use the data exclusively on the band, gap, band structure calculation. But in our, in our case, we did not perform that filtering. We just used all the data. So if there is, uh, I think the data quality is sort of uh, lower than what the CGCN have. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the uh, crystal formation energy model. In this case, I, uh, I prepared a, a more realistic data sets here, I queried all the <clears throat> ABO3 materials from the materials project. So we know that the famous perovskite material have this kind of formula, right? And uh, so the, all, the total number of data points is about 2,400. And again, we first construct, construct the structure object list and also the uh, property list from this data set. As, as you can see, uh, I also showed the distribution of the, da the data, and uh, it has a relatively nice uh, Gaussian-like distribution in this case. And uh, again, we split the data into a train and a test by 80% uh, to 20% split. And uh, using the same, the same uh, model construction process, we are able to construct a magnet model. Uh, you may notice that this process is almost identical to the molecule. That's why, again, I have to emphasize the transferability of the uh, magnet model. So you can essentially construct the exact same type of model for both uh, molecule and the crystals. And uh, since the formation energy per atom itself is a uh, intensive quantity, so we don't have to uh, convert it convert uh, it by any means. And uh, I also have an additional input parameter it's called the number of blocks because this data set is relatively large and uh, I have to reduce the number of uh, convolution blocks to make it uh, uh, accessible on my laptop. And so the training of the model is still the same and I train the uh, data for uh, five epochs. And lastly, we just predict, predict the test structures. Again, as you can see that uh, by training such model, uh, by only five epochs, we are able to predict a, a quite nice trend. Although the, the energy range is vastly different, that's probably because uh, for one, you, I only trained five steps, and for, the, uh, for, for two, the data set is, is still relatively small. And as, as you can see that I did not constrain any uh, elements. It's different from the molecule data sets because the molecule data sets, we only have the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. And here, the ABO3 data sets, we can potentially have all the 
all the metal elements in here. So it's it's a much larger chemical space to work with. And that's why our model performance is actually relatively weak in this case. But still, we are able to capture this trend in the data relatively well. So uh, any, any questions on the crystal, crystal models? Uh, could, you, could you please repeat that again? The crystal material with different uh, size. You mean uh, pretty large crystals? Oh, okay. So that belongs to uh, a different uh, regime. Basically, here we are tr we are dealing with uh, we are just using the atom as nodes and the bound as edges. Maybe in that case, you may need a different definition of your graph, right? Because in that case, you will have a relatively large system. It's not just uh, like uh, hundreds of atoms. Probably you have uh, thousands or tens of thousands. And you, theoretically, you still can use the, the magnet, but the, the, then you have to uh, have the sufficient data to work with. And in that case, I would say it probably it's not an ideal scenario for application of the magnet that we show here, but you can develop your own way of encoding the materials using a sim much simpler approach. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so last, let's go to the, uh, the multi-fidality networks. So here, the multi-fidality cross crystal networks is the, the one that we showed earlier in the, in the slides. And then uh, we first load, load the data, and then we, uh, but here we have to specify the, diff the two different, different uh, targets. One is the PVE band gap, and the other is the GRBSC band gap. So those are like uh, two different, you can, you can treat them as two different data, data sets. And we can see that the, the PBE data sets is slightly smaller than the GRBSC. And um, the key point here is that when we, when we are doing the uh, struct, structure graph calculation, we have to tell the, the, the model that one type of uh, data has a different state, right? As I mentioned earlier, here I'm encoding the PBE to a state of zero and the GRBSC to a state of one. And in the same in, a, in in the same time, we have to uh, copy the structure copy the structure twice if we have a different targets. And then we split the data again the same as before. And uh, here, here um, uh, the the construction of magnet model is slightly different. We have to tell the model that there are two fidelity of data, and uh, we have we want to embed the fidelity into a sixteen bit vector. All the rest are almost the same. All the rest are the same. Yeah, that's, that's the, the, the only difference here. There are differences in the data construction and also the slight difference in the model construction. Then we can train the model the same way as before. You see that loss actually reduce uh, over time. And we predict the model, we predict the data on the test data set. And here, here again, those are the, uh, the test parity plot. And, uh, Again, for, uh, I would like to sh also show that for the same structure, you can actually predict two different properties depending on the state of the structure. So for example, we load this structure, and if, if I set the state to equal to zero, which means I'm trying to predict the PBE band gap, then I get this value, and then I can also set the state to one, which means I want to predict the GLB as C band gap, and we'll get, the model will give a different, uh, different, slightly different results. And that's, uh, that's how we work with the multi-fidelity uh, models. And, and uh, all those packages has been uh, open source on this uh, GitHub repo, and you may need, want to check it out if you're interested. So any questions on this side?
Yes, yes, that's definitely the the case. Uh, that's definitely one of the things that we try to solve using the multi fit out. Essentially, we try to combine different source of the data, but they have they they are the same type of properties. Then we try to combine them to improve the the uh, either the calculation or the experimental predictions. But uh, for improving, but for in in your case, you have uh, the calculations and the uh, the experiments, and uh, theoretically we can include both together if, if we have a large enough data and then next time we have a calculation that we want to perform we can just use the model to predict the experimental band gap of this uh, material yeah any other questions Yes. Well, well, actually, you can see it as uh, the the model itself can predict all the different levels of uh, fidelity information, right? And then we just compare the same type of same type of uh, 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 functional to the same type of uh, prediction. For example, we com compare the PBE band gap, the calculate the PBE band gap to the predicted PBE band gap. It's like, it's like for one single model, we can choose to predict a different functional uh, output. So there is no comparison between, for example, the PBE and our experiment. So those comparisons are uh, meaningless in, in this current setting, right? We compare the PBE to the PBE prediction, we compare the experiment to the experiment prediction, and that's it. Yeah, that's actually a very good question. Uh, for actually, I thought of, I thought about this. If if for example, if we uh, uh, you actually you, you can swap the sequence, and that's uh, that shouldn't be a big deal. And uh, uh, I personally have haven't tested it yet because uh, because there is a very nice uh, li sort of a linear with linear uh, workflow if we go from uh, age to. Uh, nodes and to the global states. And theoretically, you can do it in other sequence and it shouldn't really matter much. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Oh, actually, this is the end. Yeah. <laughs>